Hello, hello, welcome to Quackalope. Thank you for being here. Today we are bringing you a right for you, wrong for you review of Frostpunk the board game. By Glass Our Cannon Studios. Our official final-ish thoughts after about 50 hours worth of gameplay. Uh, now, some of the caveats we need to get out of the way. I covered the prototype back in the day. Mm -hmm. Was very excited about the game then. Absolutely. I now have done a sponsored gameplay with yes. Glass Cannon Unplugged. Was Absolutely. very excited about the opportunity to dive into this. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, uh, we have spent probably about 50 hours reading through yeah. the rulebook, talking with the developers, playing the game. Uh, about, Seven or eight times? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Diving through it multiple times. Uh, and this format of video is not necessarily designed to tell you our hardcore opinion. It's much more about whether or not this game is going to be a fit for you and your gaming group. Mm -hmm. In our Right For You, Wrong For You format here on Quackalope, we go over seven categories we like to consider when deciding if a game should go onto our shelf. We give you a quick overview of the game, the structure, the components, what exactly is happening here. Then we take a deep dive into the theme, one of the most important aspects of any board game ever. Theme. We discuss the accessibility, we have brunch over the gameplay, we analyze the modes of play, we go surfing on the question of innovation. Finally, we take a sniff test of the price, and now, here on this series, we give you our final thoughts and verdict at the end of the show. Do you know what I'm most disappointed about? Huh? There are no dice to put in her mouth. Not a single die. Not a single die. Not a single die. Shame. It's very, very disappointing. Luckily, Shame. we are going to continue having the sanctity of uh, dignity that the dignity of this particular prototype game has established. All right, game. Man. Let's Straight talk up. about this game. West Todd, can you please yes. give me an overview of what exactly Frostpunk? Is. So, Frostpunk is originally an IP from a video, video game uh, of called Frostpunk. Uh, it's basically a dystopian future where the people have found themselves plunged into a deep despairing area of hardcore winter days and nights. And they have fled the current areas where they are looking for these ancient uh, stacks uh, generators that they use coal to fire them and then heat the surrounding areas. But you can't stray too far from the center uh, heated area, otherwise you will freeze because everything outside of this zone uh, gets too cold. And what we are doing here is trying to survive. We're not necessarily trying to thrive and live for the rest of our days. We're just trying to get enough to get here till we can find either other places where we might be able to, to help and, and share with other communities, or at the very least, figure out a way to permanently find a place to live, because so far we haven't located that that location yet. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff going down on this game. Uh, there are a lot of little systems to manage. When it comes to the core elements of this, this is actually a cooperative Euro-like experience, a cooperative worker placement resource management. Yes. Just a quick scan of the boards that we have. Over here we have our heat and generator track. That's where we're going to be slowly building warmth across the settlement, building uh, buildings and zones that the generator is keeping healthy so we can go take actions in them. We're going to have our morality track or our uh, moral track. Our, this is going to be yeah. the thing that's giving us us the encouragement to continue playing and also the despair necessary to survive in such a wasteland. If either of these tracks get too high, the generator might explode or we may lose hope and expire. Up there, we're going to have our time track and also our weather and event track. There are going to be things that are happening in the tableau here. Some of them are controllable. Some of them come up due to the uh, scenario that you're playing. Correct. All of them can be planned <clears throat> and predicted around except exactly when they will happen. For instance, the storm, the great white blizzard may flow through destroying your tents, getting rid of your production and your technology, your early era stuff. Yep earlier than you wanted, and then you have to just think on your feet and deal with it. Here in the center, we of course have our giant generator, we have the zones that we're building out, and we have the buildings that we're placing on. We do have the deluxe Kickstarter edition with the uh, washed miniatures. If you don't have that, you'll be playing with little cardboard tokens. Honestly, while the miniatures look very nice, the cardboard tokens give you all the information mm -hmm. you need to play the game thoroughly. Over on my side, we have our dusk board here, which will give you your dusk cards as well as your social dilemma cards. You also have the expedition areas here, which will allow you to, to search through other areas, hoping to find either more people, resources, or, uh, you know, potentially some other settlements and places for you to end up going. You also have your uh, death tracker here across the top, tell you how many corpses are just randomly laying around the gates. Uh, you also have your workers, your uh, storage area for all of your different things like wood, coal, and 
and uh, steam cores and steel. Uh, and then down here at the bottom, you have your people management zone, which will tell you how many sick people you have, how many healthy people you have, and if you are going to uh, starve your your people or not, your citizenry. So, if you're a fan of Frostpunk already, or you like cooperative Euro games, especially ones that give you a ton of mechanics engines, a ton of win and loss conditions to play with, and a lot of resource management and tactical decisions to make throughout the course of gameplay, Frostpunk still might be right for you. Mm -hmm. It reflects the video game very, very well. Yes. Moving off of that into the thematic side of this, what is the theme of this? We've already been over that a little bit. Yeah. And where do we see the theme of this shine through? <laughs> we see the theme of this shine through in the constant, what are we going to do? We don't have enough actions. How are we going to try to make the civilization survive? Because we're literally going to freeze tonight. Yeah. There is so much theming here. So much, It's dripping on every action that you take. You're worried that your generator is going to blow up. But you're worried you don't have enough coal and resources to build the things that you've got. You literally cannot do everything you need to do. It is absolutely impossible. You will have people die. You will have people get sick. You will have the generator potentially blowing up on you. You will lose hope. You will lose discontent. Uh, you're going to have issues. You can't do it all. It's a matter of trying to figure out what the right uh, amount of good versus evil actions you can take. That's really what it boils down to. I, I really believe that this game does that in spades. Yeah, there is a lot of thematic overtones here in Frostpunk, and it matches very well with the video game. Now, the places that I see theme come through the most are going to be areas such as the aesthetic development of the city itself and some of the mechanics that revolve around things like story events, consequences for actions like, like uh, different rights or laws mm. that you've enacted throughout the course of play and the little bits of flavor, artwork, and flavor text they give you. If you're a thematic player and you want a game, a Euro style game, a resource management game that is dripping, palpitating, designed around the theme that it's set within, Frostpunk is doing that. Mm -hmm. But you probably do need to spend a little bit of time hunting for it yourself. Take the time to read the flavor text out loud to the people that are playing. Mm -hmm. Take the time to think through the consequences, the actions that you're taking. Because those consequences, those moral dilemmas, those decisions that you're making, they have real stakes in the game, mm -hmm. and they should have real stakes while you play. Do you shelter your children, potentially getting more technology, or put them to work early on, enacting laws like child labor, allowing you to start getting the resources that your civilization so desperately needs. Frostpunk in, is dripping with those decisions. In addition, there are times when things will happen, social discontent areas will, will show up, and someone will be having a bad day, there's a loud noise outside, and it's constantly bothering them. You, as the ruler of this area, have to decide what you do, yeah. and that action will have a massive impact on the rest of the things that you do. Yeah, it could never come back or it could literally be the thing that breaks the game mm -hmm. for you. So you have to weigh every single decision. So if you're looking for, like I said, a Euro style game that is dripping with theme, that is designed around the, the lore and the world that it comes from and does a very good job at giving you tons of thematic integration in nearly every single module while still being overlaid, a very, very open phase strategic puzzle, mm -hmm. Frostpunk is there for you. Let's move on to accessibility. How easy is this game to table? What is it like to get off the shelf onto the table in front of you? This game is not easy to table. <laughs> not I, I'm not going to lie to you. This yep. game is not easy to table. And I think the designers know that. And, and that's not a bad thing. You can see there is so much stuff here. Okay, there's tons of stuff. You've got your different hex tiles, you've got uh, starting tiles, you've got all these different pieces to lay out on the board, different uh, card things to do. Now there are inserts in the box, which is definitely helpful. It'll help kind of sort some of the things as you're laying things out. But every single time I've put this game together, it has taken me a minimum of 40 minutes. Uh, and that is being very generous. Yeah, we have had to be very purposeful with our decision to get Frostpunk to the table. Mm -hmm. And that's came both from having a contract with the publisher that allowed us to get it down for some gameplay on camera, mm -hmm. and then also our desire, right when it first came in, to get this down to the table initially because we were excited and it had just came in and it was something new. Without that burning desire to actually play this game, I think it would be a very hard thing to just happen to have played. Absolutely. Uh, and so, as you're thinking about the accessibility of this, Keep in mind, this is a game that you need to be invested in, you need to be excited about, you need to end this video ready to go grab it in order for you to start getting through the barrier of entry. Mm -hmm. Along with that, when it comes to the modules, the systems, and the approach to learning this game, 
This is a heavy, it's a very, very, very heavy mechanics game. The themed game. This is a very heavy game. I think it's like above a four point something on BGG. Yeah. It's, it's uh, a very, now, very it has a very game. high rating on BGG, but it also has a very high weight rating on BGG. So don't approach this uh, from a light gamer standpoint. Yeah, the the rule book is very thick. The rule book um, does walk you through the setup process, which is part of being a good rule book, um, but. That is probably a 15 page uh, setup situation. Yeah. So, uh, keeping all of that in mind, it is very heavy. There's a lot of rules and there's a lot of, like you say, levers and things and that you're pulling. And I would very much recommend you check out some of the channels that have done dedicated content on this as the first approach to this game. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the rule book is probably the best way to actually learn Frostpunk. There's just too much that is almost impossible to get your head wrapped around all in one sitting mm -hmm. and you need to experience the game before you dive into it Definitely. so there's people like one stop co-op shop there's rolling solo there's our gameplay uh that is worth taking a look at to refine and get yourself familiar with how the operational systems flow and then actually getting to it yes the final thing that's going to help with accessibility and i have it set over there is an app you mm -hmm. can actually download a companion app for this that does a very good job at supplementing the rule book with helpful clues, uh, little areas where you can click on an icon and it gives you all the information you need and a round and section tracker, helping you take it and boil it down to the 12 different phases that it has right. and then taking it step by step. It might only be nine, but it uh, certainly one, is two, a lot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, so it's nine phases, but yeah. I will tell you, they do have a card that, that walks you through that, which is great. And there's a little token which goes across there and that the is nice also great. The nice thing about the app is it doesn't need you to go back to the rule book. Instead, yeah. it provides all that information that you need right there on the page in front of you. So we do highly recommend highly. the app when it comes to accessibility of the game experience. So if you're looking for a heavy game, if you like a game that gives you a reason to pull it off the shelf, if you're insanely excited about Frostpunk, or you're the type of gamer that really doesn't mind a challenge or a puzzle, you're, you're actually one that seeks these type of games out. I know there's a lot of you out there. Mm -hmm. Frostpunk will present you with one that is going to be... Uh, hard for you to win mm -hmm. and always challenging for you to overcome. I'll be clear about that as well. The final thing for accessibility, you will lose this game. A lot. And if you're a solo player or a cooperative player who likes games that you will lose and you will know, I swear, you will know why you lost, <laughs> Frostpunk will give that to you. Yes. So if you want a game that's going to spit in your face and smile about it, come check this one yeah. out. All right, moving on to gameplay. West, this is not how to play this game. Right. This instead is what about the gameplay either makes this right or wrong for you. What stands out? What should people know about? So it is, it is set up in a bunch of different steps. So it walks you through the step process and it guides you through how everything works. And oftentimes I feel like sometimes that can be very fiddly. I don't feel that here. Well, I think it's because I'm so excited to get to the action phase um, because there's so much sitting inside this action phase and each individual phase that you're gonna go through, the dusk phase, the morning phase, the weather phase, it all has a massive amount of impact in the game. The other thing that I think Frostpunk does extremely well is that no person sits idly by while this game is being played. Mm. I mean, we've played two player, I've played solo. You need all the brains. Yeah, and, and <laughs> there's no, you can put all the brains together and you're still gonna lose. Yeah. But the good part about it is that you're gonna have a good time doing it and you're going to feel the repercussions of everything that you do at every single station as you're walking throughout your day. And if you're not weird like us and you're not playing on camera if you're playing a three or a four player <laughs> game everyone's actually going to have their own sheet yeah, over here exactly there and are different these roles. are going to break down the elements of the cooperative game experience that each player is responsible for dividing mm -hmm. up the obligation to learn everything into Just the obligation to know your section and to know your section well but to only know your section. That makes the accessibility in the gameplay streamline a lot better. Yeah. Outside of that, one of the concerns that I might have, one of the things that I should present to you is uh, twofold. First off, there is the opportunity for a lot of AP and mm -hmm. debate in this game. If you're not working with a group that knows how to run a cooperative system and say yes to things and move forward, Frostpunk is one of those where you can min-max every decision and it still might not be enough. You just don't have everything you need, so you're going to have to choose a pathway. Do you get cold? Do you get wood? Do you build houses? Do you not? You're going to be sacrificing in some area, and that sacrifice can create a lot of action paralysis. 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 AP. Action paralysis. 
Analysis paralysis. Analysis yes. paralysis. Mm-hmm. That's where I messed up. That's okay. That's mm-hmm. where I went with the paralysis mm-hmm. afterwards. We, we heard AP and we went right with you. you okay. Know, applied physics. Beyond, <laughs> <laughs> beyond that, this is also a game that I think reflects the video game well and one of the yeah. negative parts of the video game. One of the things that I always struggle with when it comes to civ builders or settlement developers is uh, the fact that end game strategy can kind of be very obscure and it requires you to make it to end game to even know what to do in end game. I'm that type of person that plays Civilization through the first two or three hours and then restarts again at the beginning because I like the <laughs> development up to the point where I can compete for Space Age. Mm. And then I just don't know and I've never been there long enough to really be competitive and I just enjoy being hunters and gatherers. <laughs> That's kind of the same here. Even after our you know seven, eight plays of this, mm-hmm. this is one of these games where... I know the beginning rounds way better than I know the end rounds because I've lost in different ways at different times. So I get up to some of my higher level buildings, my higher level technology, and it's just kind of a shot in the wind. It's reacting to whatever is happening on the board, and oftentimes that's not good enough because you need to think ahead for you to actually be competitive and win. Mm -hmm. Uh, Outside of that, any other major concerns we have with gameplay, things that people should know because it might just not make this right for them, I, I do believe that some of the rules can be a little fiddly. Yeah. Um, and we just some of the did terminology... a top 10 rules you might miss. I mean, yeah. we did that for a reason. There's a some fiddly little systems here. So, like, you can think that you're playing the game correctly and you're probably playing it wrong. If you win this game really easily, you are a thousand percent <laughs> playing it wrong. If you I lose guarantee this game it. consistently... You should double check the rules, but you might be playing right. Yeah, you might. You still you might, might be yeah. playing right. You might um, just be bad at board games. But I think other than that, that I mean, that's the major thing for me is that some of the rules were a little fiddly. Some of the, the iconography may be a little bit of an adjustment. Um, but overall, yeah, there's and a lot of action going on throughout the game. For me, the last thing I'll note around gameplay when it comes to stuff that I really enjoy, stuff that, that I thrive on with a game like this so much, like you were saying, mm-hmm. so many of these systems are so tied together, this really does feel like steam vents just boiling to a crisp, right? Yeah. Getting ready to spurt out in different directions, and you are balancing all of that. I love that feeling. Mm-hmm. This game always gives me that pressure pot. Yep. And so I'm sitting here, and I'm looking at the six ways I could lose, and I don't know which one is going to be yeah. the way. Yeah. And one of them will be. I already know that. But I don't know which one. And this time, I'd rather not die because the last children, you know, mm. cut their wrist on a broken piece of haywire that was stuck in the sand. You know, they shouldn't have tried to sneak out of that boarding facility that we put them in with chains and locks I on the know. doors. Just they should have just stayed there. The where rats they in there was supposed to be their food group. Yeah. I just love the pressure this game puts under you, and the Mm -hmm. gameplay does that to you. It's designed to do that to you. The way it staggers and stages the actions and the results that you're taking, the way that it integrates the the theme and the story arcs into the deck of cards that you're pulling every single dusk, the way that the decisions you take actually result in losing meeples or miniatures or reflect in having not enough resources for later rounds or your coal, not being able to heat up this generator so that you actually have frigid actions, and that results in more and more people getting frostbite as time goes on it just does all of that so so well. so well so well so if you're looking for a heavily complex game with really really great uh thematic overtones if you're looking for a game that combines mechanics in a very fascinating way to create a boiling pressure part pot that you're facing off against frostbunk it, it might it might it might, it might, might be for you might be for you let's move down to modes of play what ways can you play this game And this is where we're going to be a little limited here because we actually have played this all together. I played it solo. Oh, okay. Yeah, I played it solo at my house. So uh, I played it twice solo at my house. We have... Completely wrong, mind you. But I played it and I loved it and I lost very badly. Now, theoretically, I have played higher player counts back with the original TTS mod. Right, true. But when it comes to my experience here, it's primarily been two-player with you. Right. Uh, So approaching this, so looking at this... What are the modes of play like? Where can you see this working very well? Where can you see this not working very well? I have thoughts, but I'd like to hear yours. Oh, I think it's a solo experience. It's, it's absolutely magnificent. You will sail into the world with your own thought process uh, moving forward. I think two people is amazing and great. 
I'd love to try it at four people where each one manufactures their own section so you wouldn't have to worry quite so much about all these other things. Um, and, and you could really focus on just your core mechanic area that you're really the most concerned about. Mm. Um, but I also believe that there is a higher stage of opportunity for analysis paralysis and, and fussiness within So that's within my your big thing. I agree with you in theory at solo. I 100% agree at two player. Mm -hmm. I think when you're getting up to three and four player, you have to play with a group that does not get bogged down with AP. Yep. But the flow of the game can really be maximized at those higher player counts. It's mm -hmm. one of those games that is rewarded by having more people helping run the engines that are here as opposed to one person who knows the game very well and someone else that's just theoretically joining. Right. Uh, beyond that, what about replayability? What about the versions of this game you can actually approach? Because Dude. this is not the only setup. Oh no, this is, uh, so there's a new home canyon or crater, there's new home canyon, there's uh, then there's about, I, th I think, gosh, I want to say there's 15 or 16 Journey different to things. Journey Niflheim. Yep, and then there's uh, trying to find the restroom. Um, there's all kinds of different ones. There are different ways to play this, different setups that you can go through. So, and then within each scenario, we have played this one, this exact scenario, mm. twice now, mm. three times actually. Mm -hmm. And was in either of those, was it the same? No, no, not even at all. Same. It was I've even, gotten even better. Remotely I've the gotten same. better at approaching it. Yeah, I understand the puzzle a little bit more, but it doesn't it doesn't feel the same. It hasn't felt the same. So here are the variability things that you're going to have while you're playing the game. Now, uh, you, while the map technically is the same as far as the basic setup, the tile structure that you're going to be laying out is going to be laid out completely differently. You in this scenario, we didn't even fill in the rest of it. So you may not even like us fill in the rest of the map, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. The next thing you have is you have these technology cards. There's a whole bunch of technology cards. So you have the opportunity to be experiencing different types of technology while you're moving throughout. There are uh, a total of eight laws that you're going to be going through, and then you're going to be adding an additional four laws out of an, a total of, uh, I think, another eight or nine on top of that. So those laws can be different. The consequence of those laws are going to be variable as well. Absolutely. And every time you enact a law, you're going to be adding more dust cards into the deck over here, which is going to change the way that that works. There are a ton of these morning cards, and I think as we've played this seven or eight times now, yeah. I'm sure that there's morning cards in there we have yet to even touch. Positive. There's weather cards over here on the side and the way that those come out they change the way that things work while you're with your expeditions and there's, there's just the whole pathway pathway of, of research that you're going yeah, down absolutely whatever you decide to invest in is going to change and then the thing i interrupted you over these navigations, yeah, your every expeditions. single one of those are going to be different. Absolutely. Yeah. There's so many different ways to experience this and so many different variable paths and levers that you're pulling throughout the game that I can't imagine you ever playing a game even remotely close to the one that you've yeah. played before, even with the same scenario setup that you've got. Yeah, I mean, I, I will, you know, so wrap up this section by saying plays great at solo in two, theoretically plays amazing at three and four, with the caveat that you want to make sure that you don't have an overly AP prone group. Yeah. And on top of that, when it comes to replayability and variability in this game, it is dripping with lots and lots to do. If you're a solo player or a two player that wants to spend a lifetime on a game, this, this is, is one of those you certainly could. Yeah. You could spend the next year getting this to the table every single week, and I do not think this would start to grow stale if it's the type of game you love. Yeah. Uh, so, if that's what you're looking for... This is a game for you. It, it very much might be. Let's talk about the big question. And this is mm -hmm. a hard question. So we always ask the audience to leave their comment down below what they think. Is this innovative? If so, how? If not, does it matter? Oof. Innovative. Yeah. So define because I innovative. Like, when, I, when I think about my board game shelf, sure. I have games that are competing with other games, and I like having games. Some games earn their slot onto my shelf mm -hmm. because they specifically stand out in a way that I do not feel another game does. That, mm -hmm. to me, is innovation. Now, of course, there might be games that have done it different or done it earlier or done it before, but when we're thinking about Frostpunk, when we're thinking about what this game is doing, the core experience of it, is it new? Is it unique? Does it stand out amongst the other stuff we have played? Is there stuff that it's doing that's like massively different than everything else? I'm sure that all these mechanisms are in other games. Are they in it to the same level of this? I don't think there's another game out there that gives me that seat of the pants every single second, every ounce, everything I do has a massive impact on every single part of the game like this game does. I can think of some uh, cooperative adventuring games that give me some sense of that, where, where okay. like Kingdom Death, where life and death really matters. True. But in a Euro puzzle? Yeah. No. Right. Like, I don't... 
I mean, yeah, there, you're you're right. There are campaign games in those rooms, but not in a Euro puzzle like this, where you're pulling different levels and everything touches everything. Like, I don't I don't see another game that does. I that. mean, the closest thing that I could possibly compare this to in terms of the experience and the feeling would be a game called Uprising, which is mm. a 4x cooperative game where you're trying to balance these tribes as they fight against warring factions, both from inside the city and from outside the city. Okay. And that feels that, like the consequence and the challenge of death is there and everyone has to be on the same page to move it forward. Sure. Uh, but it's not quite the same experience at the same time because you're very much your own tribe as opposed to building a settlement together. I, I honestly think that Frostpunk presents something very unique and very different in the genre of Euro worker placement, resource management games. Mm -hmm. I think it does a lot of things the same. A lot of things that are very familiar. Mm -hmm. I don't know that any one thing stands out as entirely different. You're developing zones, you're placing workers, you're getting resources, you have limited zones, limited actions, you have evolving decks. I do think, though, the combination of all these disparate elements into the puzzle that this game presents is unlike something that I know. Mm -hmm. I do not know another puzzle that is presented at this scale, to this degree of complexity, to this degree of challenge, and yet is still playable like this. Yeah. Hard to play. Hard to get everything right. Yeah. Hard to get to the table. All of that is still true. All, and yet at the same time, when you do, when you do sit down to dive into this, this is giving you something standout new. I don't think I've ever played a game seven or eight times, never won, not once, <laughs> and ever said, I want to play it again. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed that. That was so much fun. The only thing that I think might be innovative in and of itself, in my opinion, would be the integration of the dice tower in the center with the heated regions and the heated buildings. Mm, the sure. way that it actually is changing the nature of the game through a heat map that is overlaid on the table. And I really like that. It's one of the ideas they've taken directly from the video game. And I think it works very well here. And they've done it in a simple and, and readable fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that might be one of the mechanics that I think I don't know of another game that has done that type of... Uh, th the board itself changes based off how you interact with a center spire. Hmm. At the end of the day, yeah. I think this is a innovative game. Can we tell you exactly where and how it is? No, because it's in the combination and the story that it tells. But whether or not that matters to you is going to be a decision for you. Hmm. If this sounds right for you, I don't know that whether or not it's truly innovative should matter. Mm -hmm. So make a decision for yourself. Is it right or wrong for you? Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about the price point. Now, I don't remember what it was on Kickstarter. I know right now, the game... Is this third party going for 150 or is this like you can buy like, a standard edition? I don't know if it's retailed out anywhere, anywhere right now, but I know that you can buy unopened versions of the retail without the washed minis and stuff like that. Right at that $150 About price point. About $150, yeah. If you want all the washed stuff, there's things on eBay for in the nature of... 200 to 250 is the asking in total actual sale price. Um, Do you and, want to check real quick what yeah, the uh, yeah, yeah. Frostpunk Kickstarter was at? So what what the original price was? Because mm -hmm. my assumption, and I, I could be wrong on this, but I see no reason why this sh is not going to be made available again. Uh, it is it is came out to enough critical acclaim that some type of module, some type of uh, you know uh, expansion, some type of, uh, of of extra system would be mm -hmm. very cool. So what, so what are we? The core pledge, which gives you the base game of Frostpunk. Now keep in mind this was uh, this was in the midst of the pandemic when we didn't know what the world was going to do. Yeah, so, so this was prices, this closed October prices, 30th of 2020. Yeah, these prices are lower than they probably should have been, mm -hmm. but, okay. Uh, for the Core Pledge base box, uh, the uh, Frostlander expansion, which I believe gave you the uh, upgraded meeples, um, and all unlocked stretch goals, and the appreciated tower like this was a total of 75 pounds, so it's roughly $82. Okay. Uh, the Deluxe Pledge, which gave you the board game, the miniatures expansion, which wow. are these things here, the, the upgraded uh, resin items, uh, as well as the tower and pre-shading for these things as well, that was 125 pounds, so okay. call it $130. The Gamer All In Pledge gave you all of that stuff, plus you got, um, I believe, the mats. Frostpunk board game, the miniatures expansion, the resources, oh, the resources, and the Dreadnought. Yeah, so you got the okay. Dreadnought, and that was 170 
Okay. Uh, and then there was a collector's all-in, which gave you some posters and some other things. But okay. let's call it 170 pounds was the the top then. So so you're getting... and with shipping added on and with yeah. the market having changed, it sounds like the right price is in that 125 to about 150 dollar region for the base for game. The base, yeah. And then you're getting up into the 200 dollar region, yeah. 180 to 200 dollars for the washed and miniature expansion. Right. What do we think about that? What What do we think? Uh, when it comes to the price point and what this game is demanding. For, I mean, even to be brutally fair, just the base game alone, you don't you don't have to have all the extra stuff. Do you think the extra stuff adds value enough to add that extra $50, $60 on top? Okay, so I love the Dreadnought. I really want that. It doesn't take away too much in my experience. I really like it. I think that these houses are probably unnecessary mm. because they are a whole bunch of stuff that you look at. We don't even play with the upgraded uh, meeples because we like these wooden meeples I better. do like the wooden meeples better. Yeah, yeah that's um, true. However, I do like the upgraded resources, but they're not necessary. Sure. Um, we, you know, you have to use the cubes here for the coal anyway when you're dropping it into the system. Although technically you can use the others, they just don't fit in this board over here on the side. Mm -hmm. um, I do like the way that the trees and stuff look, so I don't mind using the upgraded miniatures, but I think you can get away with the, the base and be perfectly happy um, with everything that you're dealing with. And I don't see a reason to is the go base, beyond that. Is the base a good value? For $125, I feel like, or $150 even, for an unopened version, I feel like that's a pretty good value. For the game that you're getting, there's a ton of stuff here. Yeah. Uh, on my end, I was actually surprised to see how low those Kickstarter numbers were mm -hmm. in the Kickstarter pledge itself. Yeah. I think that $125, like if, I, if this came back to another crowdfunding platform at the just under, like shy of $199 price tag, mm -hmm. getting up into the $120 price tag with some of the upgraded resources or anything like that, mm -hmm. I think there's a ton of value in this. Now, this isn't a minis heavy game, no. but it, it's going to come down to the puzzle that's being presented and the amount of design that went into that puzzle itself, sure. combined with the fact that this is a IP purchase, meaning there's some type of overhead cost Absolutely. that the publisher is paying in order to, to print and publish and produce this game. I am going to differ with you, though, when it comes to the miniatures. Really? As much as I don't think miniatures are oftentimes of value or necessary in gameplay experience, I love the thematics of watching your city develop. That's Man, fair. I love the aesthetic of this so much, and it just would not be the same game for me when it comes to the, the world that I feel like I'm set into mm -hmm. if I didn't have these miniatures out. Now, of course, I didn't place every single one of them out as we were playing the game. It got right. to the point where it just wasn't necessary, but I did from the very beginning when we started doing this gameplay. Oh, you insisted. I started placing these out, <laughs> yep. and it takes a little bit of extra time. It, it takes does. a little bit of extra fiddling. And yet, at the same time, I think it sets the tone for me. I would have no problem paying that extra $50 for washed, aesthetic gameplay. It's not necessary. I do think it changes the experience just enough for me to, to really relish it. I really love the Dreadnought. I wouldn't play without it. So, last section of this video. New section that we've added on uh, over the last few months, over the last few pieces of the series. Uh -huh. Our personal verdict. Now, keep I all the caveats we've given you like in this mind. Part. Uh, but yeah, no, like what's, what is, is this game, we've, we've, we've analyzed whether or not it's right or wrong for the viewer. Right. Is this game right and wrong for us? <sighs> this is such a hard one. <laughs> this is so hard. You okay. don't, you don't understand. I, I really, really like this game. Yep. I really like it. Okay, I really, really, really like playing this game. I lost every time I've played, and I still really like this game. If someone told me that they wanted to play with me and they were gonna set it up for me and, and like I had the time to play it, I would be there 100%. I will teach you how to play the game because now I know it pretty well, uh, and I would love to play it with somebody. It is never coming off my shelf. It's not, sure. because it's an hour to set it up and then I don't have people other than you to play it with. And I know we don't have time to play it. If there is, if, if I had the three hours that's required to play the game, plus the 45 minutes of setup time, or I had a dedicated place where this board was just always out and it was ready to go and I could just pick it up and play it, man, I would play this game. What, like what crazy. about the solo experience of it though? Is that, so, is that competitive? It's so good. If you had, if you had a dedicated space, cause right now you have kids, which make that hard. Yeah. But if you had a space in your house, would you leave this up for a month or two and just keep continue diving into it? You know, I probably would honestly. I mean, I, I have the board game table so I can put it underneath there, but it's, it's currently set up with uh, other campaign stuff, but 
I this this could be something I could work through every single piece of. I could play all that stuff, and I think that's great. The problem I run into with games is if they take too long to set up, and if the gameplay is more than three hours, um, or even approaching that three hour mark, I end up finding that they just don't come off my shelf. Mm. So that being said, I love this game, and I think it is for me. Mm -hmm. But it's probably not for me because it won't likely leave my shelf because there are other games that are faster to get to the table that are more likely to get played at my house and by my friend group at home. Yeah. Which is sad because this game is great. Yeah. It's really great. I, I always have a hard time with this part of the analysis of this video as well mm -hmm. for a different reason. I don't know if it's fair to analyze games as a content creator, mm -hmm. right? Verse analyze games from the perspective of Jesse, who is a board gamer mm -hmm. and remembers what it is like to not be obligated to play games, but yeah. instead uh, to sit down and own games that I specifically want to play. As a content creator, we are oftentimes working around what is going to be good for the channel uh, and what is hitting a deadline or what is brand new or what is a contract or what is a prototype or, or what has a Kickstarter coming up. Like, There's so much that goes into our ability to get stuff to the table. And so, uh, with that lens, I think that this game is 100% right for me. Mm. I, I mean, it was in my top 10 of 2022. Mm -hmm. I think it is a mind-blowing uh, integration. I love, I love running the operational systems. I love the, the nuance and the complexity in it. I love the story and the theme that it's telling. It's one of the more thematic heroes I have played. Mm -hmm. All of that makes this right for me. I love the video game as well. And dub them doubling down on a video game IP that I'm a, a massive fan of and bringing that into the tabletop setting, I love to see what this is doing. Mm -hmm. And at the same time as a content creator, I don't see a lot of opportunity to pull this off the shelf. Just like you're saying, yeah. it is very hard to justify the amount of time it takes for me to play this. Yeah. However, if I step myself away from the content creator experience that I currently operate in and I place myself in front of the camera as Jesse the board gamer... This is one of those games that I wish I could spend a season on. Mm. I really do. This is one of those games that it comes in, and just like Oathsworn, uh, just like Townsfolk Tussle, just like Kingdom Death, just like Aeon's Trespass Odyssey, mm. this is one of those games that I believe in my gaming repertoire deserves two to four months where it lives on a table, where I play it multiple times a month mm -hmm. with the same group of people, and I continue diving in until probably I've won two or three of the scenarios. Yeah. And I know there are people right now out there in the world. It's the it's the 500 people that have already rated it on BGG right. that are doing that with yeah, this game. For sure. And I am jealous of you. Me too. So, uh, my, my ruling is that this is right for me. This is 100% right for me. With a strong caveat that I also don't know how often I'm going to be able to play this. It's very hard for us when we're together uh, to get it to the table. Mm -hmm. And that, that sucks. It's sad. It's really sad. I This is a game that I absolutely want in my collection 100%, but it'll sit on the shelf because I just, yeah. that game group isn't there. But it's so good. So it's that's so good. going to be the final crux of it for you all when you're looking at this title and deciding if this is going to be right or wrong for you. The final question that you should be asking yourself is, can I give Frostpunk the time that it deserves? Mm. Because if you buy it, if you own it, whether you're playing it the moment you get it in or you're saving it for a year down the road when a child's going off to college or something like that, take a look at it. If you can, if the answer is, I believe I can take the time that it needs to get it up, get it running, get it played, then get this game. If you are a heavy Euro person, you deserve the opportunity to experience yeah. this game. That being said, the answer is somewhere where West and I are, where you just don't know where your board game time or your board game group is going to fall. Uh, take a closer look. Yeah. Double check and maybe wait a season. All right. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being here. This has been a longer past 2 a.m., but there was a lot to talk about here, and we're very excited to give you as much information as possible. It's not past 2 a.m. It's a right what? for you, wrong for You're you. You're right. Yeah. But it's nearly past 2 a.m. It is nearly past 2 a.m. <laughs> this has been a longer right for you, wrong for you. Whatever the case, whatever you do, remember to do the important thing. Get out and play some, frost some games. We'll see you next time. All right. Bye. Bye.